Welcome to Engineering with Rosie. Today's video is about vehicle to grid technology, V2G, which is something that I'm really excited about because it has the potential to help solve some of the most challenging aspects of the clean energy transition. But even though the technology holds a lot of potential, it isn't being used on a large scale yet. In this video, I'm going to ask a V2G expert a bunch of questions I have about the technology and why, if it's so great, why isn't anyone using it? I recently had the chance to talk to Bjorn Sternberg, who is a researcher at the Australian National University working on a V2G project called REVS, Realising Electric Vehicle to Grid Services. Now that project will have 51 electric cars, which are part of the Australian Capital Territory government's fleet, and they'll be demonstrating on this relatively large scale how V2G can work. I helped Bjorn and his team make an explainer video on their technology, which you can find here for a good explanation about the REVS project and V2G in general. So the way it works is that batteries in electric vehicles connect to the electricity grid via a two-way charger. They monitor the grid frequency to tell whether there is a balance between electricity supply and demand. So when demand is higher than supply, the frequency drops and the REVS batteries will kick in to supply power to the grid. And when supply is higher than demand, then the frequency will rise and the REVS batteries will start charging to take on some of that extra load. Now, I have been a long time fan of V2G because it kind of feels like buy one, get one free. We buy electric cars to clean up our transport system and we get the freebie of extra electricity storage to help solve some of the big challenges related to an electricity grid supplied by a lot of variable renewables. So in the past, when we had really physically big generators with heavy rotating turbines generating our electricity, the system was pretty tolerant of small changes in demand. These massive turbines have a lot of inertia. They're really hard to slow down quickly. So that makes it relatively easy to keep the system balanced. Without that physical inertia, the balance can be disturbed more easily. So we'll need a fast responding option that can keep the system balanced. And since batteries don't have any huge heavy components that take a long time to start up, they can provide that really fast response. And when you think about car batteries, all of them together, it's actually quite a lot of storage that's available. Even though people buy cars to drive around, they actually spend most of their time parked. That valuable asset just sits there most of the day doing nothing. You can supply a house's electricity for several days off a fully charged electric car battery. And if all of Australia's vehicles were electric, the total storage is huge. It's about five times as large as the Snowy Hydro 2.0 pumped hydro project that's currently being built in Kosciuszko National Park. And it's more than 10,000 times larger than our famous Hornsdale Tesla big battery. In fact, it's over three days of the current electricity consumption of the national energy market, which covers all of the eastern part of Australia. So like I said, I am a huge fan of V2G and I have been for years. The idea isn't new. There have been plenty of trials before this ANU one that have already demonstrated the capability of vehicle batteries and the two-way chargers to provide this service. In fact, the ANU REVS project uses off-the-shelf commercially available cars and two-way chargers, so no new tech there. But if the benefits are so big and the technology is already available to buy, then why haven't we seen V2G rolled out all around the world? wherever there are a lot of electric cars or anywhere that needs more electricity storage in their mix. So this question had been bothering me for a while, but recently I got a chance to find out. I visited the ANU to see their first car and two-way charger in the REVS project, and I caught up with Bjorn in the Distributed Energy Resources Lab to ask him a whole bunch of questions about V2G and what the remaining challenges are to see it go from small-scale trials to mainstream rollout. My first question was one that I have heard many people express concerns about. Won't the car batteries get damaged from so much charging and discharging? I mean, people are already pretty worried about battery life for EVs that are just used for regular driving. If we use it for V2G2, is that gonna shorten the life even more? Yeah, probably two parts, mm -hmm. two part answer. Um, the first is that what really impacts battery life is when you drive with them at high power. So going back to that, mm -hmm. how much energy you put through a battery over a year um, has less of an impact than mm -hmm. the way in which you do that. So 
um, if you charge really hard, discharge really hard, that has more wear and tear than if you charge slowly over a day and then discharge slowly over the night scene. Mm. Um, electric vehicles are an example where you're driving the battery really hard because you want to accelerate. Oh. So that's really a much higher wear and tear use case mm. than vehicle to grid, oh, okay. where you're generally like uh, using power more, more gently or softly. Okay. The sec second part of it is that with the way that we're using our vehicles for, for vehicle to grid, mm. they're really getting paid to just be available, to be on call for the power system. Mm. Um, so whenever they're plugged in, they're monitoring the frequency and they're ready to charge or discharge power if needed. Mm. But we only have situations where um, the grid needs that extra power a dozen, two dozen times a year. It's really only when there are major disturbances, think of like a big storm or something coming through, knocking out a power station. Mm. It's only in those rare occasions that you actually need that power. Okay. So the actual wear and tear on the battery is, is very little because you're only using it very fast. Okay, so that's the first objection out of the way. Battery degradation shouldn't be a problem because you can get a lot of benefits from V2G without actually running the batteries very hard or cycling them very often. But what about the huge extra load in our grid? Like I said before, if you add all the batteries up together, they make a huge amount of power. If we're charging all those cars at once, will we need to upgrade our grid before we can start adding a lot of electric vehicles? So there are a couple of parts to that. So yes, electric vehicles obviously need electricity to charge. Mm -hmm. And if all of Australia's vehicles, including trucks and buses, were electrified, that might be about a third more electricity than we use in total at the moment. Mm -hmm. But that electricity, they need that in, in quite a flexible way across the year. So we can spread out that another third of electricity that we need to produce. We can spread that out. And beyond that, we can also then match when we're charging our vehicles with when there's abundant wind and solar generation. So it really is a way in which you can, that flexibility in, char in that load, in mm -hmm. charging those vehicles, can really assist you in um, making the most of your solar and wind resources. And then there's the whole additional like positive of being able to draw upon the energy that's in the batteries. So that's the vehicle to grid part of it. Okay. Where if all of the 19 million vehicles in Australia were electrified, they would store five times as much energy as the planned Snow 2.0. The two components to it, it's like the power component and the energy component. Mm. So that comparison actually with Snowy is comparing energy, which yeah. is like how much power over time you can store. Yeah, how much water's um, in the dam. How much water's in the dam, yeah. how many electrons are at one side of your battery. <laughs> um, and that really is not, that's the kind of energy storage is the forte of, of pumped hydro. Yeah. Um, that's kind of, it's one trick that it can, is really good at. It can really store a lot, a lot, a lot of, energy. of duration of energy without adding a lot of cost. Yeah. Right? yeah. Whereas batteries generally don't get used so much for energy storage. You're really more after the power component, which is that they can go from maximum discharge to maximum charging mm. in under a second. Okay. So you have a lot of power that you can draw. So that comparison with Snowy actually looks even better if you compare power of batteries to the power of the Snowy. Yeah, hydro. so you're talking about the rating, like how big the generator is, yeah, how exactly. many electrons are coming out per second or yeah, whatever. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. All right, so there's two aspects to it. Yes, there will be a huge extra demand, um, but if we use smart chargers, then we can actually use that demand flexibly to soak up extra renewables when there's a lot in the system. And then you've got the storage component, but how does that work exactly? How will my car battery be used to support the system, but also still function as a car? I mean, that's what I bought it for, right? When there's an unexpected event, such as a storm, takes out a power line, takes out a um, power station, or takes out a really large load as well. So if you like just a smelter, like, aluminium smelter yeah, suddenly goes has offline, much, then you yeah. have like a lot more power than you need. Yeah. Now, your frequency is going to deviate, either going up or down. Mm. Um, and then what, how our market is set up is that once the frequency goes out of a certain bound, for, um, then the, our number of generators that need to kick in and respond with the responding within six seconds, 60 seconds, or five minutes. Okay. Um, in each case, it's the same idea, but as a generator, you've committed to um, jumping in when mm. you're called upon. Um, if there is then an event, you then need to provide your power within that time. Okay. As we kind of clean the electricity system and get more renewables mm. and kind of therefore um, kind of have more variability in generation and want to match, want to control that by having more storage in the system, mm. we're moving towards having a faster frequency response market as well. It might be responding in less than a second. Oh. So that's really, really well suited to battery. 
So that's interesting. I can see how, yeah, so I've got in the future when we've got our either our V2G all set up nicely and I've got my electric car plugged in at home and I can easily respond in six seconds. But then how long is it going to go for? Are you going to, am I going to get in my car and I want to go, I want to drive down the coast and I find my batteries flat because it was preventing a, a blackout or, you know, like I'm not going to, enjoy, I'm not going to be happy with that. So really just using the energy in the vehicle's battery for these really critical moments that occur very rarely across a year. So it might occur one, most two dozen times a year. Mm. And during that event itself, it's really about the role of batteries in particular is about providing really power really quickly. Mm. So within six seconds, our EVs will be discharging at full ball. But we'll only generally have to hold that power for six sec for 60 seconds. Okay. So a minute's worth of power out of your electric vehicle is gonna have no impact on how far you can drive. Okay, so if battery degradation isn't a problem and the large added demand from having a lot of EVs can actually be a good thing because it adds demand flexibility. Um, I also won't have to worry about my battery being drained when I want to use it. And we have a lot more agile system when we use batteries instead of the old inertia-based system. So that's a lot of pros so far and no cons yet, which doesn't make any sense to me because V2G is not being used anywhere, not on any large kind of scale yet anyway. So why don't we just roll this out as fast as we can get EVs into the country? To be honest, it seems to me like we're stuck in this old fashioned way of thinking, just, you know, like not really recognizing the possibilities, only thinking about the problems. You try and make electric cars as much like petrol cars as possible, try and squeeze all the new energy technologies into the old systems constraints, um, you know, where we had to deal with base load and we had the inertia as both a pro and a con. So it seems obvious to me that if we would just instead embrace the, the possibilities of this new, agile, flexible energy system, that would pretty much just work out better in every single way. You're providing essential services relied upon every day of the year, every second of the day. Mm. It's very hard to change that in process. You don't have the, the luxury of kind of being like, all right, everyone know electricity for a year, we're going to redesign <laughs> everything and then start from scratch, Yeah, which would make the transition like, in almost infinitely easier. That's how I would so, do it. As an engineer, yeah. like, that sounds let's very just, neat. Let's we, just, we just turn everything off for a bit seconds and start from scratch. Yeah. yeah. It would be much, much easier. Good plan. Um, everyone will be happy with that, yeah, won't everyone they? Everyone just, just like candles and camping for <laughs> yeah. the next year and then we'll get back to it. Yeah. Um, so no, I think that moving it while it's in process, that's the, the real challenge. And I agree that in the electricity system, very much the way that we're talking about, particularly inertia, which we talked about in, in the context of these frequency support that our vehicles are doing. Yeah. That's something that we are kind of familiar with because that's the way that generators and fossil fired power stations happen to work. They happen to have a mass that spins. Yeah. But electronics works entirely differently and has a lot of advantages in how quickly it can work and how how it works is at the discretion of the humans who program it. Mm. Um, so we could be de developing in an entirely different way if we were to start from scratch. But instead we're in a situation where we're trying to integrate new technology with old technology and we've got to do that in this seamless way that we can go from lots of one to all the other yeah. without the lights ever going off. Electric vehicles have really been trying to prove themselves as vehicles, mm. as vehicles kind of quite closely matched to conventional vehicles as, as possible. Mm. So they're mm. really trying to like prove out range and kind of it looks the same as a regular vehicle and it does all the same things. Mm. But as a vehicle manufacturer, it's quite daunting, I think, to start having conversations with your customers, not around how fast can you accelerate, how cool is this car, how smooth is it drive, how quiet is it, all those sorts of things. But to be like, oh, so how do you get your electricity? Okay. Like that's not a conversation the car manufacturers have ever had before. No. And the, the flip side is also true that now um, for electricity companies, they're very used to selling electrons, but they're not used to selling cars or talking about how to charge your car. So there's just new conversations that both the electricity sector need to have mm. with customers and the transport sector needs to have with customers and that the transport and electricity sector need to have with each other and finding the, the comfort that you have addressed the previous um, kind of attacks on electric vehicles that they don't go, that they ruin the weekend or whatever mm. um, some politicians have claimed. So we've kind of, we've won those. We can now go out and actually be like, not only do they do all the things that you want from your car, but actually they'll avoid you ever having to go to a petrol station. They'll be able to power you when you go camping. They'll be able to power your house for a couple of days in a blackout. 
Yes, okay, point taken. So I was pretty much just being a typical engineer, focused way too much on just the technology. I didn't see any technology issues. And so I was like, why are people being so dumb? Why isn't V2G already everywhere? And the reason is that it's not actually the technology that's not ready. It's not the car batteries. It's not the two-way chargers that we're going to have a problem with. It's how do we use it and how do we absorb it, not just into the electricity system, but also into business models. And that's one of the things that REVS is really delivering on. Because we're not just have these vehicles kind of testing them in the lab or, or out in the field to see, oh, yes, they do respond to frequency. Mm. They're really out there. And whenever they're plugged into the grid, they're getting paid to be on call. Mm. So we're doing all of the integration between the vehicle and the charger, the fleet company who manage the, the fleet of vehicles that we're working with, the electricity retailer who's then bidding that availability of battery capacity into the national market, getting paid for it, and then the money comes back down through the chain of organisations. Okay. So there's all of that that needs to be put in place. And as I mentioned earlier, kind of the, the transport sector and the electricity sector have historically been pretty separate. Yeah. So there's a lot of kind of new conversations and new systems that need to be put in place across those. So we've got to go through this process like for a first time and the first time you do something is always the hardest. Yeah. The idea of you know, um, this trial is to, to do it once, have a lot of learning and then have it be easier for others to do the same thing and bring V2G kind of to the mainstream. It's the acronym Rev, REVS is mostly because it sounds like revving a car, but it's also about realising <laughs> this service. Awesome. Thanks, Bjorn. I, I was actually so satisfied by that interview. I really did get my answers for my main question. If V2G is so great, then why aren't we using it? And I will still remain a V2G supporter because the potential that I saw is there. It can make the challenge of transitioning to a clean economy easier on several fronts. Um, I want to mention that Bjorn told me he's been working on a kid's book about the energy transition, which I thought sounded really cool. And um, if you're interested, there will be a Kickstarter campaign on that coming up. So uh, I'll put a link in the description to where you can get in on that if you want. As always, tell me in the comments if you found anything in this video confusing or if you thought I missed some obvious questions or if you'd like to suggest a topic for a future video. And if you want to support the channel and help steer its development, then you can join the Engineering with Rosie Patreon community where we come up with ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. Um, we vote on topic ideas for future videos and share advice on how to improve production quality and stuff like that. If you're interested in clean energy technologies and the engineering um, behind them, then check out the other videos on my channel and I'll see you in the next one. And does it not look funny with that in... Yeah, that's like part of the charm. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's fine.